Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live from Multispeed Technologies, the Ask Noah show starts right now. This is the show where we came to do all the things on Linux they said couldn't be done and take your questions on how to do the same. The phone lines are open. It's a free call, 1-855-450-NOAH. That's 1-855-450-6624. Or send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. My name is Noah Chalaya. I am your host. Delighted to be here with you as another episode of the Ask Noah Show kicks off this hour. Joining me, my co-host, Mr. Steve Ovens. Welcome in, sir. Good evening, Noah. We're finally starting to dry off down here. How's it going up there? I, I, I always say that I hope that summer falls on a weekend so I can make it out to the lake this summer. So... <laughs> <laughs> if, it, if summer falls on a weekend, I'm gonna go out to the lake, and we're we're like we're like not in freezing temperatures. So I guess that sounds good. I mean, we're a bit above freezing, but it was just it was just been rain. I mean, the rain's been good, but it's nice to see the sun again. Absolutely, your calls, your messages are entertained at one eight fifty five four fifty no. That's eight five five four five zero six six two four. The email live at asknoahshow dot com. So I wanted to start with this uh, this evening, Steve. So. We've all heard of Protectly. In fact, I think that's your router at your house, right? It is. So love the devices. I think they're great. Um, but one of the things is that oftentimes when you get above every hundred dollars, it seems like you stamp people out and they kind of fall off. They atrophy off pretty quick. And so the lower that you can get a cost of a device, the, the better. And I came across a device made by the same manufacturer that manufactures our white label router that we use for doing a rack mount. So short, short story rehashed. Um, the cheapest routing appliance that you can buy brand new from a lot of the companies that will support OpenSense, PFSense out of the box are like $1,000. And we needed something that was rack mountable, but that was not that much money. And so we were able to come across a company that sells a rack mount, one new rack mount version for just like three, 400 bucks. And so that means cost of the client is like under $500 and that's pretty solid. Well, we came across this straight up made out of Chinesium device, which as far as I can tell, Steve, looking at it, out of the box, it is the Protectly. It's the same Chinesium that makes up the Protectly. It just has a different sticker on it. But it's $170. And the cheapest I could find, the, the Protectly, was a little over 200 So it's a little routing appliance. Um, it's available on New Egg. It's, the, it's a Celeron N3050. It's made by the company Husun. Uh, it supports PFSense, OpenSense, Untangle, all the rest of it. It has, they advertise it as two gigabit NICs. I will tell you, I ran iPerf. They are not gigabit NICs, or at least they don't perform at gigabit NICs. So if you need get full gigabit performance, this probably isn't the guy for you. But if you're one of those people that are saying to yourself, self, I really need to get into a professional routing appliance and I want to learn some things about it, I think the RTL 8111H gigabit Realtek router might be something to check out. So I'll have a link for you in the show notes. Looking at it, Steve, does it look similar to the Protectly? It looks similar. Um, I don't know. I bought a higher end Protectly because I oh. just didn't want to deal with it. I think mine ended up coming in at three hundred bucks. Yeah, mine is definitely bigger. I've got the I've got the four ports with the dedicated WAN, so technically it's five ports. So, um, yeah, I, it looks similar, but it's definitely not the same model that I have. The other thing that I came across this week that I thought would be of interest is, as some people have followed along, I have given up desktop computing and switched over to laptops only with Thunderbolt. Now, I may regret that decision to work my way back at some point, but at the moment, I have a Thunderbolt dock at my office. I have a Thunderbolt dock at the radio station where I work. I have a Thunderbolt dock here, and largely, I just take my computer and plug it in from one place to another. Now, that's provided itself a number of advantages to include the fact that when I build my workstation at home, I built it with the monitors I like, I built it with the keyboard I like, I built it with the desk I like. I built it at the height and the setup I like. And I plug my work laptop and all of a sudden that perfect computing workstation is my work laptop. But five seconds later, I disconnect my work computer at six o'clock and I put it into my backpack and my personal laptop comes out and it gets docked via Thunderbolt into that exact same perfectly set up workstation. And now those same two monitors, that same keyboard, that same mouse, the same speakers, the same setup is capable to be used with my personal laptop. I've been pushing this towards clients. And telling clients, hey, if you move towards Thunderbolt, I think that will provide you a more flexible work environment. And those that have followed have been really happy. There's clinics, there, there's clinics law offices, 
Um, there's an engineering firm out in Wisconsin, and, and they've largely adopted the model of they, ha- they give Thunderbolt laptops, they plug into Thunderbolt docks, and as a sneaky side benefit, when I go to those clients now, I'll just take my laptop and find a docking station and plug in, and it's great. So I've really enjoyed that. In the past, when people have asked about Thunderbolt docks, I've recommended the Thunderbolt, uh, the Lenovo Thunderbolt dock. No matter what computer you're working with, a Mac, a Dell, uh, uh, you know, an actual Lenovo, I think they work really well. And I like them for a couple of reasons. First of all, it supports three displays, which I like. The second thing is it has a disconnectable power supply and Thunderbolt cable. So the, the one thing I've watched get destroyed on Thunderbolt docks over and over and over again, the Thunderbolt cable itself makes sense. It's the one thing that you're connecting and disconnecting, but some of the Dells have the cable built into them. Some of the newer models have the cable built into them, but you can open it up and unscrew it and replace it, but it's still kind of a pain. I really like just the ability to unplug the Thunderbolt cable. And I think the Lenovo Thunderbolt dock checks all those boxes with the latest version of the version four. It uses Thunderbolt four or USB four, which is backwards compatible with USB. So you, I plugged in my son's Chromebook and it works just fine over that Thunderbolt dock. So I really like that. This week I came across a brand of Thunderbolt dock called Cal digit. Now the Cal digit is considerably more expensive than the, than the Lenovo dock by about a hundred dollars. And when you're talking about a $300 dock going to a $400 dock is I consider it to be a, a, a pretty substantial increase. However, comma things I like about it. One the, this is going to sound kind of stupid, but all of the ports, all of the necessary ports are at the back. So the audio port, the audio 3.5 millimeter audio jack on the on the Lenovo one is on the front and you have to route the speaker cable around the front, which I don't I think kind of looks tacky with this. They give you a microphone input, which the Lenovo Thunderbolt doesn't have a speaker output. And it's all inside of the back. They support display port right out of the right out of the box. But then this is the killer thing. Three Thunderbolt ports three. So where that's advantageous or where that came into play a couple of different times is newer monitors support going over type C and you have PCI enclosures that uh, go over Thunderbolt. And so you start to collect all of these Thunderbolt accessories. Well, with the Lenovo Thunderbolt dock, you're really limited to the Thunderbolt port on the back for the host computer. And then I think there's one on the front, but that's really about it. With this one, you get three Thunderbolt ports on the back and then you get a USB two USB C ports on the front. Additionally, you get a USB A port on the front, an additional headphone jack, and a memory card reader on the front. It has wired Ethernet, a 2.5 gigabit actually wired Ethernet at the back. It has a Kensington lock and then its own power supply. It's a little pricey at about 400 bucks, but I purchased the TS4. I've run it with a Dell. I've run it with an Alienware. I've run it with a MacBook. I've run it with a Lenovo ThinkPad. They all work spectacularly. So this is my new go-to Thunderbolt dock. Uh, are you ever up for an upgrade at a laptop uh, with Red Hat, Steve, or are you just like it goes into the closet and you use your desktop? Uh, no, I have a I have a laptop that I bring around with me. I actually just got a refresh. Um, and uh, I was just looking at this CalDigit. It actually looks like a mini PC for mm. the people that are trying to picture it. Mm-hmm. It looks exactly like a mini PC. So the front of it's got the the SD card slot and it's got a micro SD card slot and all the other ports that Noah said. But if you're thinking about like when Noah was talking about a dock, it does not fit my idea of what a dock is. It basically looks like another mini PC that you plug your laptop into and then it plugs into all the things. So the other thing that you might be of, that might be of interest is you can, it can be positioned either way. So it comes with vertical feet or horizontal feet. So if you want it to kind of hide neatly under the monitor or I built mine into my desk. So the dock itself is part of the desk. Uh, if you do that, you can put it in the horizontal configuration. If you want it more of like, almost think of like a book standing up on its side, it supports a vertical configuration as well. And so then you have, like you were saying, kind of that mini PC style where it's just a little box on the desk that you, that you plug everything into either way. I'll have a link for you in the show notes at podcast.asknoahshow.com Cal digit, the thunder Bolt Station 4 or the TS4. Our first email this week comes in from Craig. Craig writes in and says, Hi, Noah and Steve. I've heard of Graphene OS mentioned several times, and I've looked in the show notes. I'm wondering if there are other viable options for phones than using a Pixel. The thought of buying an unlocked phone directly from Google, just don't want to go there. Also, seems hit or miss buying an actual bootlocked unlock one for eBay. Any advice there? Do you accept the risk of running a sandbox profile with Google services? I still want to be able to use Android Auto in my vehicle, and there appears to be some workarounds, but it looks like having the sandbox profile as an alternative for using maps and other things may be necessary. Finally, if you had to get rid of Graphene OS, 
Is there another phone option you'd personally recommend or use? Thanks again for the insightful show. I appreciate the things you cover on a level for noobs or experienced folks to like. Don't discriminate. Craig. So, Steve, you've been rocking Graffino S almost exclusively now for a few months. What do you think? You know what? It's fine. I, I have no complaints, really, overall. Um, I am the wrong person to give a good review to the general masses about using a phone because... Uh, <laughs> So this happened today. I had a call. I was chatting with a colleague over our, our work chat and he's like, oh, I'll just, you know, like, let's let's have a phone call. And usually that means like Google Meet or a Slack uh, call or whatever it is. Uh -huh. Right. Uh, but he pasted his phone number and I was like, oh, I'm going to have to go actually. And I told him, like, I actually have to go find my phone. I have no idea where it is to give you an actual call. So I'm not really a good person to uh, interpret how well the once the a month that you turn system. it on to open the one app you use, how does it work then? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, it pairs with my watch. That That's basically, I use it as a Bluetooth extender to get notifications. That, <laughs> that is essentially what my phone is for. Um, so I'm not a good reviewer insofar as I like the fact that it is really stripped down compared to a stock Android that you might get other places. I like mm. that. I, mm -hmm. I would have removed all of the stuff that I could anyways, just as a a matter of preference. So it does what I want. I've never had an issue with it, except I do have one major problem with it. The Marriott app doesn't work because it thinks that it's rooted. And so mm. when you try and launch it, it gives you some weird gibberish error code about being rooted and then crashes. Interesting. So I am, I am a, I am a, a phone hater in training. Steve is working on me. Uh, and so I have lived now, this will be day number 13, I think, without my phone. So my phone has sat inside of, on, I, have, I built this little charge. I've talked about this before. I built a type C charging station at my house and my phone hasn't really left that in the last two weeks. Um, and the reason for that is, is I'm trying to move a, a, away from being married to a phone. And if I have to dig into a device that that device is going to be a laptop computer. And so the way I've chosen to accommodate that or the way I've chosen to accomplish that is I signed up for an account with my friends over at jmp.chat. Now, jmp.chat, if you're not familiar with them, is messaging for geeks, phone service for geeks. Uh, you can have multiple phone numbers, one app. You can share one number with multiple people. It's free as in freedom. Your phone number on every device. Only $4.99 a month. They have a custom app, the Geogram app. So if you want to just download an app and use the service as if you had a text slash voice call, you can download the Geogram app and sign in with your account and Bob's your uncle, you're good to go. Now, where it gets really cool for the open source geeks among us is if you say to yourself, but no, what if I don't want to use their app? Well, guess what? Their app is an open source app that's forked from an open source app called Conversations. So you can just download Conversations, sign in, and it's almost the exact same experience. The only difference is you have to know things like the XMPP server that you're using and stuff where they automatically fill all that information in for you. But if that doesn't bother you and you want to leverage all of the XMPP stuff, you're, they, they, they leave it wide open. You're welcome to do so. So I installed Linphone on my laptop. And I installed Gajim on my laptop. Gajim handles all of the text messages via XMPP. It's an XMPP client. And Linphone handles all of my phone calls. Linphone, I was able to add two profiles. So I have my JMP profile for doing my personal cell phone stuff. Cell phone, but it's with JMP. And then I have my 3CX extension added. So my work extension is just another profile in Linphone. Works fantastic. I'm able to take calls. I'm able to send and receive text messages. So as far as anybody on the other end is concerned... I have a cell phone just like everybody else. The difference is my cell phone doesn't transmit signal seven. It's not locking into any sort of towers. It's just wherever the Wi-Fi is, it funnels that stuff over IP and I'm able to connect. They don't block any connections from VPNs or private internet access. You're able to connect from anywhere in the world. It works fantastic. Um, now, JMP has also recently rolled out something called the JMP SIM. Now, the SIM is a really interesting prospect, and they sent me one that I've been playing with, and I, I, I'll, after I have a chance to really give it a full test drive, I'll report back. But it is $7 per gigabyte and $5.50 per year. So there's some of you are like, did he say $7 per gigabyte? It's not designed to use data. That's You're missing the point. The whole idea of the SIM, you have to think of it like gap coverage. So you're on Wi-Fi. Everything is working. But every once in a while, you get a text message, or as my wife pointed out, what are you going to do when you leave the house and your daughter gets taken to the emergency room? 
do you want to know about that? Well, yes, I want to be interrupted with that. Well, the the XMPB message or the element message or the Telegram message, those are going to traverse the data and it's not going to take a gigabyte to send that information. So you get that notification when you're in your car and you just make an intentional decision that anytime I'm going to do something data intensive, I'm going to make sure to connect to Wi-Fi. If you're willing to play that game, they're willing to give you one heck of a deal at $5.50 a month. So this is, it's really incredible, but it's designed to be used in conjunction with the jmp.chat stuff. So other options of it. So, so all that to say, I've managed to transition myself over to my laptop. Now, stage two is I need to transition myself back onto a telephone. Now with my personal phone, I've switched to Graphene OS. I have had no problems. Granted, I don't use a lot of the apps for things. So if I'm staying at a hotel, I just go to the hotel site and typically I'm doing all that from a phone or from a computer, really what I want on my phone phone, I want Bitwarden, I want Element, and I want the ability to, to make and receive calls and, and send and receive text. And really send and receive text is really just a backwards compatibility layer until I can get everybody onto some newer, more modern piece of messaging technology. So it's been the, the, the Graphene OS phone has been, and Google Pixel 6 has been working fantastic for me on a personal phone. Now that I've successfully divorced myself from my work phone and moved on to a laptop, I'd like to move back onto a Graphene OS phone. So as soon as budget and time allows, I'm going to purchase a, probably a newer Google Pixel and I'll move back into Graphene OS. You asked for different options. I'm going to give you different options and I'm going to conclude by telling you why I'm not using those different options. I'm sticking with a phone from Google, which sounds a bit counterintuitive. I'll explain in a second. So one option is Lineage OS. Now, Steve, you were telling me that Lineage OS, if you flash it onto a phone, it supports a much wider range of devices from just Google. It's basically ASOP, but it's ASOP and you get to add back in what you like. So if you want Google Play services, you can do that. Yeah, the way that it works. And so part of this was uh, Sleuth was helping me fill in the background for for it technically, but essentially you, you have to uh, add a recovery ROM to it and then you flash lineage OS. And while you're doing that process, you can choose which flavor of uh, G apps to install. So they've got the really, really tiny, like the bare minimum. They've got one that just adds in the Gmail and one that has play service and all the way up to, you know, everything plus stuff that isn't included by default on Android. And so it's, it's, really a useful tool for someone like me that I don't want all that stuff. If I'm installing lineage, I don't even want the Gmail client. Like I, I use proton mail and so I don't even use all of that stuff. So I strip off everything that I can and I'm, I'm assume I'm not alone in that kind of thing. So I really appreciate that ability. So lineage OS is definitely a route to go down, particularly if you don't want to buy a Google pixel. They support a ton of devices and some really old devices. So that's absolutely uh, worth looking at. I'd also suggest looking at post-market OS. I'd be lying to you if I told you that I thought post-market OS was ready today to replace your uh, as your daily driver. I think there's going to be some uphill challenges there. But post-market OS is one of the only other, that's maybe not fair, but it's one of the uh, most widely supported out-of-the-box encrypted operating systems that you can do uh, encryption on a lot of the other ones that are leveraging uh, Linux on the mobile devices don't support encryption out of the box or it, you got to jump through a lot of hoops to get there. Not with post market OS, it works and KDE mobile is getting really, really good. So those are both options to keep your eye on. I would say lineage OS is absolutely there in some ways. Lineage's OS is there more than Graphene OS is as far as a straight up replacement for Android. Um, Graphene OS, if you want the extra security, um, but I would also, Take a look at some things like post-market OS. Then there's Selfish OS. Selfish OS, I still maintain to this day, the best mobile operating system I've ever used insofar as the experience, okay? They, they polish everything. There isn't a rough edge left on it. It makes Apple look like a beta project. It is so polished and so refined and so well done. And they have solved problems that literally exist on every other smartphone. For example, I have not found a smartphone in the last probably 10 years that my fingers, because I have small hands, can reach the entire screen real estate. Well, Sailfish OS solves this by when you do the menu or the selection tools, you can grab anywhere on the screen and you slide up or slide down. You basically drag the screen and the screen will then understand that, oh, he's trying to select this option or that option and it'll slide up and down. Then when you let go, it makes the selection. So you can operate the phone completely one-handed and it does all sorts of little 
again, like polished things that are just really nice. So for example, you change the background, it'll say, hey, I noticed the predominant color in this background is this. Would you like to change your accent color? And you change the accent color and it'll change the color of the buttons and it'll change the, the color of the little lights and the tabs and stuff that, that open up. And it just, it polishes everything to the extreme. And it was one of the original attempts on getting Linux to run on a, on a smartphone and they knocked it out of the park. Downsides with Sailfish OS. One, you can't actually buy it in the US. So you have to create a fake account and pretending that you live in the EU in order to buy a copy of it. And yes, you have to buy a copy of it. It's not just available to download and flash. Second thing is, there's a somewhat limited amount of devices that, that you can flash it on, but the biggest detractor from it, in my opinion, is the fact that nobody really writes apps for it. Yeah, the open source people, sure, that somebody, if you see something with fish in it or something related to fish, it probably it has, a, it has a Sailfish app for it but a lot of places don't. So if you can get by with a web browser and some and some just basic apps, I think it's great. It's not that they don't have an app store, they absolutely do, and there's plenty of really good apps and they all work really really well. But if when you go you know, there's 0% chance Marriott is pushing an app to the Sailfish store. So I don't know. They, 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 they leave some room to be desired. And the nice thing about Lineage or Graphene OS is it, it's backwards compatible with Android, right? So you can run Android apps. So when I went to a concert and I needed Ticketmaster, I downloaded the Ticketmaster app onto my phone, onto Graphene OS. Graphene OS says, hey, this needs Google Play services to run, and it just runs it inside of a sandbox. So it lets you accomplish all the things that you'd want to do with a smartphone, thereby justifying, in my opinion, to be a good daily driver. Now, why do we stick with Graphene OS? What's the advantage of that over Lineage OS or Sailfish OS or all the rest of it? And why does it only run on a Google Pixel phone? If I had a dime for every time somebody asked me, you mean to tell me the most secure mobile operating system is one that only runs on a Google phone? Yes. And here's why. It all has to do with the Titan M chip or the security chip. The Titan M chip is a chip that is built into the Pixel that Graphene OS leverages. And basically, the what, what the chip does is it allows the operating system to store a random value, a high entropy random value as a token on that Titan chip. And then it uses that as input to derive future keys. So when you want to encrypt something or you want to lock something, it takes the value from that key that's only available via that hardware token. And then it takes, for example, like your 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 passphrase and it combines the, the the it takes it takes a password token and it takes the 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 key derivative from that titan m chip and uses that alongside a waiver key that that then encrypts all of your information so in order to retrieve the waiver token the secure element or the titan m chip has to have the correct weaver key. And so they part they, they couple that with an internal timer. And that timer is basically a hardware-based delay for every time you attempt to access the the key derivative. And if you fail, it effectively doubles every time you use it. So at some point, it just becomes mathematically impossible to break into the phone. What's nice about that is I watch a lot of real time crime shows or a lot of true crime shows, and every one of them, police are just they're big on just they clone the phone, right? That's what they do. They take the phone, they clone the phone, they try and hack into the phone. And so what this chip allows them to do is effectively impossible to duplicate the information because you can write the information to the chip, but it never really gives up the key. And so it just uses it as input to sign and or encrypt other things. So if you can't break into that chip, you can't duplicate it. And the chip will actually over time as it's attacked, increase its uh, its resistance until you've eventually destroyed it. So it makes it a very, very secure. In fact, I would argue it is the most secure mobile operating system out there. And after doing months and months and months of research and trying Sailfish OS and Lineage OS and and uh, uh, and Postmarket OS, and, and if you named it, I've probably tried it. I've landed on, in the end, if you want to be able to talk to the phone, you have to use the Android drivers because that's just the way that we can talk to those chipsets. And if you're going to talk to the Android drivers anyway, why not just start with the open source code that Google has and then lock it down as much as humanly possible, which is exactly what Graphene OS has done, earning it a reputation as the most security hardened mobile operating system out there. Um, now, if you hear all of that and you're like, well, it all sounds great, and he asks for some advice on buying phones off of eBay and stuff like that, I've had pretty good luck. I, so I've bought a couple of uh, of Pixels now and flashed them with Graphene OS. Uh, my daughter has one. I've got one. A couple other friends and stuff have them. 
I've had really good luck at just looking for a bootloader unlocked pixel. And yes, you need to make sure that the bootloader is unlocked, not just SIM unlocked or network unlocked, but bootloader unlocked. Most sellers know what they have. Hey, this was purchased from the Google store and is completely unlocked and all the things. I've had really good luck with that. The other thing to remember with eBay in particular, buyer protection, man, you got 30 days. If you don't like it, you could just return it. And eBay, for all of its detractors, it's very good to buyers. Very good to buyers. If you're not 100% happy, you just send it back. So look for it to be unlocked. And then if it doesn't, you file a return, say, hey, it didn't work, and you send it back. But just know that I've never had one that didn't work. So that's a brief introduction as to why I would choose Graphene OS, why I would still go with a Pixel even though it's made by Google. And then to round it out, if you hear all of that and you're like, you know what, I'm still uncomfortable with it and I just don't know, Nitro Key. So Nitro Key is effectively a competitor to the YubiKey. And we like them because they're an open source company that manufactures open source hardware. Well, guess what? They're taking Pixel 8s, flashing them with Graphene OS, and selling them as the Nitro Phone. So you can go to nitrokey.com, click on Shop, and buy the Nitro Phone 4. It'll come from Nitro Key or f with Graphene OS installed on a Pixel 8. So you don't even have to do anything. And you can just pull it out of the box and use it. Our second email comes in from Jeremy W. Jeremy says, hey, no one, Steve. I had some feedback regarding NixOS myself. Personally, I think this thing is dead on arrival. It's good for those who like to distro hop. Enterprise customers don't care what distro they run. Typically, they'll run Debian or more likely Red Hat. Take a Target, a Walmart, a Starbucks, etc. They have hundreds of thousands of VMs. They often just use cloud as a service, and they don't see the image or vendor-managed image. They rarely touch it. AWS, GCP, Azure, it isn't going to change a million VMs from Red Hat, Ubuntu, to NixOS. It's too costly. Neither will Facebook, Google, Netflix, in their customized environments. I know because I work in these environments almost exclusively for seven, eight years. It ain't happening. Same could be said with Android phone manufacturers. There are millions of lines of automation codes for distros that they already have in place. Why would they switch to NixOS? So sure, you may get some minor movement to the desktop space. That's about it. Best, Jeremy. So Steve, I, I would tell you this. I think, so I 100% agree with what this guy is saying. I would add to that that I don't think NixOS is going to make it in the desktop space either because I think it's too niche for that. And oh, by the way, it, there's not, I don't, I don't know that there's a huge benefit. I think where NixOS is going to be beneficial, I think I said this in the show before, I think it'll be useful for building stuff. I think developers it'll be useful for, and I think products that leverage NixOS to use NixOS to spin up environments so that you can build stuff that I can see all day long. So yes, the person who buys the server isn't installing NixOS on the metal. They're installing Red Hat on the metal, but the containers that they run inside of Red Hat Maybe those are running NixOS. Does, do you see anything like that possible? And maybe they don't even know that that's what it is. They just know they pull the container down for product XYZ. It's just products XYZ found that if you want to know exactly what you're pushing to production every time, you do that with NixOS. Am I barking up the wrong tree or you think there's some merit there? I think there's merit to, to NixOS for things like reproducible builds and uh, things like SOCs or things that you need, like you're saying, like, you, I could see it being productized in the same way that a Debian base or something like that is productized for little routers or, mm. you know, you, you name it. The, the desktop use, I think there's a lot of neat applications there. And I, I think there's going to be a certain portion of the population that's going to be tuned in. And then the there's going to be, yeah, like if I tried to hand that to my dad, he'd just be like, nah, it's too much work. Even, even though it might not actually be it's you know we're talking about uh, um, um, an aging individual that wants to use his computer he's figured out how to use fedora like that's good enough right mm -hmm. and and that's he'll he'd look at that and be like why would i do this you know and i look around and i see other examples like that and so you'll get the people that are in the know and maybe they might might deploy it to people who they uh manage i suppose for lack of a better word but I don't manage my dad's computer. He lives hmm. 15 hours away. That would be a terrible idea um, as a general rule. Not to mention, he might be slightly insulted by the idea that I'm I'm managing his hardware. So I think you know, that... I'll, I'll tell you, I think one of the things... Well, this, this is something I've become an, a, just a, an absolute stickler for. When you want to set people up for success, we talk about getting people onto Linux and switching people to Linux and that sort of thing. You want to set people up for success. And I think a big part of doing that is anticipating what their problems are going to be and how they're going to go about solving them. So if you know the first thing they're going to do is go to Google and go, how do I install blah, blah, blah on Linux? We can bet 
law of averages, the statistically likely answer is whatever thing pulls up on the Google is going to be for Ubuntu or some Debian-based thing, right? Nine times out of ten. Or they're going to hit the ArchWiki. But nine times out of ten, if somebody says, how do I install this thing on Linux? They're going to get a thing on how to add a PPA or how to find... And so having a system that is, that that fits in line with what mainstream is doing, I think makes all the sense in the world for new users and or uninitiated users. So I think there's maybe a, a, a case for, for, for Nix on the desktop for the tinkers and the people that really like it and are passionate about it. I think there's less of a case for that for the I'm just here and I just want an experience unless a company or service or project or something comes out that that builds a white glove, you know, hands off distro that then, you know, has, you know, flat pack on top of it or something like that. And then effectively acts as like the endless OS thing that you and I have kind of come to love. I think there's maybe an argument there, but even then you'd have to explain to me, well, why wouldn't we just use an immutable base like Debian? What's the advantage in Nix OS? Um, and it's, and that, that's even less relevant and the advantage of a Nix OS seem less beneficial if we're pulling in all our packages via flat hub anyway. Because then, you well, know, you're not I mean, building. I'll push back on that a, a little bit and just say, so if I think about like the Steam Deck, for example, mm -hmm. and the Steam Deck pushing down a giant binary file, right, mm -hmm. as the immutable operating system. Uh, if you were to, say, go down the flake route, which is some complicated way that I don't really understand, but I basically understand it as build instructions for your for deploying a new version of Nix OS, mm -hmm. then that would save that would save everybody a little bit of bandwidth in terms of like the, the, the files going from my server to your device are mm. in the kilobytes or maybe megabytes, depending on how big this thing is, as mm -hmm. opposed to gigabytes. And then they, I mean, you'd be putting a big stress on the repositories of NixOS, but it would still, I could see there being a benefit there, even if you had your own mirrors and mm -hmm. maintaining your own NixOS package cache. So I, I could see that. Any of the like custom deployment things where you're building, like, you know, where Valve is building a specific piece of hardware, 100%. I can see it all day long, uh, 100%. I just, outside of that, outside of a highly controlled environment where you care and or know exactly what you're pushing, I don't see it becoming the mainstream thing that everybody pulls down because it's just, you know, in fact, if anything, I see the opposite happening. I see Linux becoming a, a base of uh, an agreed upon thing. Because if you think about it, if you break it down into its individual components, right? We want the newest version of the kernel because I want to be able to talk to all of the hardware bits. And then I want my user land to be modifiable so I can save files and do all of that. But I don't really want the system to be modifiable because I don't really want to break it. I really want it to, you know, receive updates. I want it to update in a consistent and predictable fashion. And then I want to play up in this upper land of user land. And it seems like between flat packs and immutable operating systems, we're there. And what you want to use underneath the base, be it Arch, NixOS, Debian, Ubuntu, whatever, I think you can I think you're I think it's I think it's you know, six to one, half dozen to the other, but I think we're accomplishing the same thing. Our third email comes in from Jeremy. Jeremy writes in, Jeremy H writes in and says, I've been using iRedmail for five years with about 20 email addresses on various domains. It's been very solid. Has a nice admin interface and both Roundcube and Sogo webmail. Sogo has a modern feel to it and mimics an exchange server. This is handy for users that are behind a lockdown network and works wherever port 443 or traditional IMAP ports. The calendar function is also very good in my experience. I set it up for phones. It's fairly simple. As far as you can tell, iOS is, as far as iOS can tell, it is an exchange server. So thanks, Jeremy, for writing in. This is in response to our ongoing discussion. Do you host mail? And if so, what do you like about it? And what are the problems? I am now entering on, I think, month number three, waiting for Microsoft to fix a client's email issue in which they cannot send to the entirety of yahoo.com. Microsoft is no longer responding to the tickets anymore. So it leads me to believe that paying for service, at least in the case of Microsoft, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have a flawless email experience. In fact, in some cases, it can mean that half your organization can't email half of their client base for well over three months. And the company that you pay thousands of dollars a month to won't do anything for you. So there's that. Uh, this at least hosting your own mail at least gives you the option to do something about it. So I'm I'm a long ways away from I'm jumping into hosting my own mail and I'm 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 leaving uh, paid services. I'm not there yet. I'm not even close to there yet. But I am listening to that conversation. And the more that I hear from people saying, 
I do it. Works fine. I have no problems. And the more I look over at this very, like, this, I mean, come on. We're talking about one of the two major mail providers on the planet, and it sucks. It's terrible. It's a horrible experience. So I appreciate you writing in, Jeremy. If you have experience hosting your own email, Stephen, I would love to hear from you live at AskNoahShow.com. From the Linux Newswire Newsroom, this is the Week in Review with JT. For the week of April 7th, 2024, here's the Linux and open source news. One of Germany's 16 states confirmed plans on Wednesday to move tens of thousands of systems from Microsoft Windows to Linux. Kodi 21 Omega is out. The Nitrix team has announced the release of Nitrix 3.4. Canonical has announced that Ubuntu 2404 beta will be delayed due to the XZ utilities vulnerability. The Endeavor OS team has announced that their ARM release will be discontinued. The Linux 6.7 kernel has reached end of life and users are encouraged to upgrade to 6.8. Qt Creator 13 is out. FFmpeg 7.0 Dijkstra has been released. And Dtrace 2.0 has been released for Linux. In AI news, a new 15 billion parameter multilingual open source AI model named Aurora M has been released. It's trained in English, Finnish, Hindi, Japanese, Vietnamese, and code. Gretel AI has released the largest open source text to SQL dataset to accelerate artificial intelligence AI model training. Silo AI has released a new Viking model, which is an open source LLM for all Nordic languages, English, and programming languages. And lastly, Framework Computer, the company behind the popular framework upgradable and modular laptops, is hiring for an open source firmware developer. A Canadian telecom, Bell Canada, has been pushing their cloud-based DVR service to fiber TV uh, subscribers for years. And while it's given customers some advantages, like the ability to view their own recordings on more devices and equally the ability to see them on things like phones, compared to local DVR recorders, users don't have as much control over the recordings as they once had. Now it's been announced that on May 1st, Fiber TV will automatically delete recordings stored on their cloud PVR offering once the recordings hit 61 days of age, as confirmed by Canadian online newspaper The Daily Hive. Currently, customers maintain access to the recordings via the cloud PVR stored for 365 days. So, Steve, not being from Canada, I knew nothing about Bell Canada. You don't like them. I have, that's putting it mildly, I have a a loathing of this company. I'm not going to rant too much on the air about it, but suffice it to say is I feel very passionately that I will not um, provide any services to them in a willing capacity, including <laughs> including giving them any business. So in uh, to give you just kind of a sense, when mm-hmm. I lived in London uh, back in Canada, I could have gone with Bell and gotten fiber because they only allow one fiber provider to the building. But I stuck with DSL at 25 megs down because I would be damned if I have to give them any of my money. Um, <laughs> I have so many problems, moral and just object to the company as a whole that I would rather not do business with them. You're a rascal in a good way, and I love it. So here's the thing. On first glance, you hear this story and you say to yourself, but Noah, who really cares about some DVR recordings? It's not a big deal. It can be. So I had an interesting experience this past few weeks. So a friend of mine was getting married and she hired a photography company to photograph her wedding. In the process of doing so, the company that she hired to photograph her wedding had a policy that you don't take photographs at the wedding if they're taking photographs of the wedding. Now, the rationale for that was a couple things. One, they want the upsell of the videos and the photos and stuff like that. But the other thing is they legitimately don't want people holding up smartphones and wrecking all the pictures. So the agreement is we come photograph your wedding. Nobody else can take pictures. It was a bit off-putting to her, but she accepted the, the terms of the agreement, went to the wedding, got married. Everything was great. So the photography company comes in, takes all the pictures, does all the videos. They said, we're going to get them to you. A few weeks later, they go out of business. My friend is devastated, devastated because it's the only photo she had from her wedding. I think they maybe had a couple that her mom like snuck on a, on a phone, but largely that entire day, the most special day of her life was not there. The Dr. Phil show reached out brought her and her husband out there, had contacted the company and gotten them to give them a copy of the photos. 
So she flies out to the Dr. Phil show. She's on the episode. Her and her husband are there. She tells the story of their wedding day and how great it was and how devastated they were that this company lost all of their photos. The Dr. Phil show says, well, we have got good news for you. We contacted the company. We were able to get copies of it. Here you go. So she's elated. Obviously, given the special nature of that show, she taped that show on her DVR. Fast forward to last week. She comes to me and she's like, no, I have a problem. I want to switch my cable service or I want to change my cable plan. But the cable company is telling me that I have to give up my analog DVR. The reason that I can't do that is that this episode of Dr. Phil, in which details the saga of my marriage and the photography crisis is on there. I would like a copy of it. How do I do that? So I, I said, no problem. And I, I originally gave her a little device that it's called a Ninja. And basically what it does is it's effectively like an HDMI recorder. So you plug an HDMI cable into it. It's got a little screen on there. You plug a 2.5 inch hard drive in, you hit record and it records. So I sent it home with her and I said, here, this will, this will do what you needed to do. So she takes it home and she comes back to me the next day and she's like, yeah, didn't work. What, what do you mean it didn't work? She goes, well, it's all it says is HDCP protected. Oh, so if you don't know what HDCP is, HDCP is copy protection for HDMI. Now, fun little fact, when you hear us talk about professional video, we talk about SDI. SDI is HDMI without all this other nonsense in there. So HDCP basically does the following. It does a negotiation to say, hey, before I send you a video signal, what are you? If you respond, I'm a display device, it says, great, here's the video signal. If you say, I'm a small little ninja HDMI recorder, it says, uh-uh, this is copy protected. You don't get to have this content. And it just displays a blue message that says HDCP protected. So I had to get around this. And there's a couple, you can kind of think of it like a modern day version of Macrovision for those of you that remember the analog video days. So the content or the source is protected. You have to get around that. Now there's a couple ways to do that. One is you, there is a device called an HDCP stripper and I'll have one linked for you in the show notes, a podcast.asknoahshow.com. It's about 20 bucks and you basically plug it in between the devices and it works most of the time. I found a cheaper and what I think is a more clever way that I kind of like better for a couple of reasons. And that is to use a cheap keyword, cheap HDMI splitter, whatever factory in China out of whatever Chinese DM they make these things out of, they don't put the effort and or the technology in to carry that HDCP signal. And so it just gets lost. And so you can buy these, it's made by a brand called Ori, O-R-E-I. And I'll have a link for you for that in the show notes as well. But it's basically an HDMI splitter. And so you come out of whatever device you're wanting to extract video off of. You plug the uh, uh, out of one of the outputs of the HDMI splitter into your capture device. And that can be anything from the little ninja that I have over to to include an HDMI capture card from something like Magwell into OBS and record it that way. Either way, you're going to be able to strip out the HDCP protection and you'll be able to make a copy of your video. So if you find yourself in this situation as these customers in Canada are finding themselves in, as my friend found herself in, here's the solution. Podcast.asknoahshow.com. Check out the show notes. Grab an HDMI splitter or an HDCP stripper. Bob's your uncle. You'll be back in business. There's been a couple of points in history at where Linux has had its biggest opportunities to make a mark and get new users. I would say one was when we went from Windows 7 to uh, Windows 10. We're coming up on another opportunity, and that is when we're going from Windows 10 to Windows 11. So as many of you know, Windows 11 requires a physical hardware chip that many older computers don't have. And so if you want to upgrade Windows 11, they have the little, is my computer compatible? And it looks for that hardware chip. Up until recently, you were just able to use Windows 10 indefinitely. And then when you wanted to upgrade to Windows 11, you could upgrade to Windows 11. I shouldn't say indefinitely. There was always an EOL. So... Microsoft has announced that for most people, Windows 10 is going to stop receiving critical updates on October 14, 2025. So that's just over a, a little over a year away, roughly a decade after its initial release. You know, you might remember when they said Windows 10 was going to be the last version of Windows you'd ever need. I digress. For people using computers that can't upgrade to Windows 11 or for organizations with dozens or hundreds of PCs to manage, Microsoft is making another three years of extended security updates or ESUs available, but only if you pay for them. So this is not something new. This has been done for years. I remember I was installing back in, how would it have been 2013, 2014, 
I was installing an ATM and I turned the thing on and I kid you not, it's Windows XP embedded. And I looked at the guy from the ATM company and I'm like, we cannot, cannot plug this into the network. And he's like, don't worry, it's patched. It's XP. How is it patched? And he went on to explain to me that uh, Diebold pays a handsome sum to Microsoft to get special security updates to Windows XP long after they stopped publishing updates to Windows XP. Anyway, they're going to do the same thing, but now they're going to offer it to consumers, you know, as a benefit to you, the customer. In a blog post Microsoft published earlier this week, Microsoft Jason Lenzik writes that the first year of ESUs will cost $61 per PC for business that want to keep their systems updated. Windows 10 gets three more years of security updates if you can afford them. As with, with the Windows 7 ESUs a few years ago, Microsoft says that the price will double each year. So the second year, the ESU will cost $122 per PC. And the third year, it will cost a whopping $244 per year per device. To put that into perspective for you, that's $44 more than you paid for Windows 10 when you bought the operating system. Microsoft says this pricing is cumulative. So if you decided to buy ESUs for year three after skipping the first two, you'd also need to pay for those first two years first. These slow price hikes are intended to drive businesses to migrate to Windows 11 as they quickly as they can while giving them a chance to use Windows 10 when absolutely necessary. Yeah, you know what else it's going to do? It's going to drive people to migrate to Linux. That's what it's going to do. Headline. German state government ditching Windows for Linux, 30,000 workers migrating. Now, you might have heard this in the Linux Newswire when JT hit us at the, at the, at the bottom of the hour. As announced, Minister Pre President Daniel Gunther's webpage this week, the state government confirmed that it's moving all systems to the Linux operating system per a website provided translation. With the cabinet decision, the state government has made the concrete beginning switch away from proprietary software and towards free and open source systems with the digitally sovereign IT workspaces that the IT administration's approximately 30,000 employees. Quote, due to the high hardware requirements of Windows 11, we would have a problem with older computers. With Linux, we don't have that problem. Schorschen Holstein is developing an open source directory service to replace Microsoft Active Directory and an open source telephony offering. Schroeder pointed to the state's government's growing reliance on cloud services and said that with related proprietary services or software, users have no influence on the data flow and where their data makes its way to other countries. He also claimed that the move would help with the state's budget by diverting money from license fees to real programming services from our domestic digital economy. So translation, the German government looked at this and went, hold on a second, 30,000 computers times $244 to do the math, carry the one. Yeah, that's a lot of money. Hey, I have an idea. Well, let's just switch to Linux. But wait, we need Active Directory. Mm, we've got programmers in Germany, don't we? Yes, we do. We care about privacy, don't we? We do. So we could solve the privacy thing by not sending all of our information to the Americans. Also, we could keep all those dollars in Germany by hiring German developers by leveraging an open source system, and oh, by the way, we don't have to upgrade any of our hardware, we can just reuse it with Linux? Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. Now, it should be noted that in 2003, Munich announced that it was going to move some 14,000 PCs, and it was an abysmal disaster. So they started in, 20, they announced it in 2003. By 2013, the Limex project was finished, but it was astronomically expensive. Why? because people hated it. So the user sat down and they went, this isn't Microsoft Office. I don't know where the buttons are. Where are the buttons are on my ribbon bar? Where's my ribbon bar? I want Microsoft back. And it didn't go well. So a few years later, they reverted back to Windows. So Steve, I'm interested in your thoughts. You come at this with kind of a pessimistic view. So part of it is I've, I've been around a lot of corporations. Now I'm not gonna say that, that this branch of the German government is this way. But I have absolutely seen companies and been a part of uh, what they call bake-offs, which is where you get a bunch of vendors in and then you you implement POCs or you make a an, an outward effort to adopt their product in a way to leverage it against somebody else. So mm -hmm. you might say if you're if you're I don't even know if VMware has a, a competing product, but like if you're evaluating three or four different VM uh, hypervisors, you you would go to VMware and say, hey, look, we've already implemented this. It, it does all we want. I think this is the route that we're going to go. And then they're expected to go back and get you a better deal. 
A hundred percent. I know this happens in North American governments. I've been there when this happens and they will leverage open source technologies in order to uh, get the proprietary ones at a cheaper price or whatever. That makes me sad. So you're telling me they're using Linux to, to, to buy more Microsoft? That's what I'm hearing? Yeah, I mean, that is a strategy. So um, it's it's just one of the things that people do. It It is what it is, right? Because hmm. at the end of the day, most places are not uh, philosophically driven. So they're just looking for software that does a thing and they don't really care about the open source ethos or anything like that as a general rule. And so if they can leverage one thing over the other to get the cheaper thing, it's like, well, I, if I can leverage this no name thing to get a cheaper version of the thing that everybody knows, why wouldn't I do that? Right? So that. Yeah, that's ultimately what I think is going to happen here, but who knows? I don't. I don't know. I'm not involved in these conversations. Yeah, a hundred percent. Well, I, I'm I'm rooting for Germany. I hope it works out. I know you are too. You're not saying that it's a bad thing. You're or you're not saying that you hope it doesn't work. You're just saying that you have a healthy skepticism after seeing people use and abuse Linux. After a while, the beaten housewife, you know, comes to expect it. So I I, I get it, but I'm I'm really hoping that this is the thing that starts to pivot. I think there's potentially a reason for it too pivot because you're watching this happen in some of the Asian countries in, um, in China and, and, and the Koreas and such. Um, Americans may soon live under a federal privacy law more than two decades after the U S trade commission, uh, urged Congress to regulate online user data collection. This bipartisan draft legislation is the best opportunity that we've had in decades to establish a national data privacy and security standard that gives people the right to control their personal information, declared Rogers and Cantwell in a joint statement claiming that the bill would give U.S. citizens control over their data who sell it. So I think the United States is a weird place as compared to other places in the world because we have constitutional rights and that means that there are limits on what the government can do. However, there are fa fairly few limits on what private corporations can do, and there's even less limits on what corporations can do to give government information. It kind of works like this. Fusion centers are federal entities collecting as much raw information about us as possible. Our cell phone activity from police using IMSI catchers, our purchasing patterns via private security companies, and social media surveillance, who we spend time with, where we go, and what we believe in. They are supposed to connect the dots for the federal government, so they are spy centers. And there are fusion centers in every state in the country, and there are six here in California alone. In 1999, the CIA founded InQtel, a venture capital firm using U.S. tax dollars to develop cutting-edge surveillance tech. Local police forces with more tax dollars handed down from the federal government then buy these technologies. The police use the tech to collect information on their populations, which is then funneled through fusion centers back to the intelligence agencies. And federal fusion centers, you know, don't just collect data from government sources. They also pick up data from data brokers and mm -hmm. other private sources. You know, once information is collected and you're in sort of that web of surveillance, you never know how it's going to end up being used. So all that to, to kind of highlight the way that that circle goes, the, the, the idea that the government is using taxpayer dollars to fund a technology spy apparatus and then sell those products to places that then collect information and funnel it back, it is time that Americans take control of their data. So I'm glad to see that this is making some progress and, and moving its, its way through. The music in my ears means we're out of time. I appreciate you joining us. You can catch reruns of the show, podcast.asknoahshow.com. There you'll find all the show notes and articles related to what we talked about. We record the show live every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central at asknoahshow.com. We're back next week. We'll see you there. Have a good week. Have a good week.